Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview, the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Thanks for watching. Waiting to be profiled is painter Tom Woodle and author Julia Braun Kessler. Tom Woodle was born in Bolivia, and he came to the United States when he was 10 years old. By 1970, he'd received a Bachelor of Fine Arts from Chouinard Art Institute in Los Angeles. Tom is one of those rare artists who can teach and still be successful in the art world of galleries and museums. Tom has taught at Art Center Pasadena, the University of California, Irvine, UCLA, UC Santa Barbara, Otis Parsons School, and that was just during the 70s and 80s. How did all this teaching come about? Well, uh, <laughs> it came about um, because of financial need at one time, you know. Artists' careers fluctuate and uh, there came a moment where I needed a job and I had anticipated this before. There was a time when I truly wanted to teach mm. and um, I uh, inquired about it and uh, I actually called Craig Kaufman at that time who was teaching at Irvine and he was generous enough to um, uh, allow me to have this job. But does it take a special skill more than um, something that an artist knows his art, but it takes a special skill to explain I the think, art? It, yeah, it, requ it requires a certain temperament and um, you also have to learn how to teach. You can't just jump into it. And over the years, I believe, I went through a phase of knowing nothing about it to becoming a really formidable teacher. And then the danger sits in a, becoming the worst teacher that you could have ever been. You Why? Know? You think that happens because you know so much about it? You get burned out. <laughs> oh, you do? Yeah, yeah. Do you draw from your students? Or do you think the exchanges help you in your work? Well, I've noticed, and I've had a particular chance to notice this when I have not been teaching and I associate with friends who are teaching at that time. And I can see that their mind is focused in a way that mine is not. They're, when you're teaching, you're s somehow more alert about, uh, you're more alert about communicating things, mm. and uh, you tend to be too much of an instant critic, too. You know? yeah, of, of their yeah. work or other yes, people's work? Yes, yes, yes. There's a certain discriminating faculty that gets developed, you know. Maybe that's what the, the difference is, this, this breakdown between uh, teaching and the life of the artist. Uh, so many artists say that teaching is like the kiss of death. Uh, and I don't know why. What well, do you think? Well, some do and some don't. You know, I have some very good friends who are really excellent teachers and they love it and they do truly enjoy and are fulfilled by that exchange. Um, I taught, as you said, for many years, <coughs> excuse me, and then I stopped teaching for a while because there was some work I wanted to do and I knew I had to devote myself completely to it. Mm -hmm. And teaching does um, require a certain amount of your creativity mm -hmm. as well as just being a guide and, you know, uh, um, uh, a facilitator, you know, for the students. You know, as maybe that's the part of it. Maybe that takes the creativity uh, a lot of it and puts it in the teaching realm so that you don't have the chance to paint for a, sh a show or to do, do the art gallery, the well, museum thing. And the other thing that I found was that um, as a teacher you have an obligation to make art 
you know, even in its most intricate and difficult areas, accessible to the students. Mm. And there comes a moment when your own work um, is not accessible anymore. And the, oh. what you're dealing with in the studio is requires your complete attention and cannot be translated, you know, mm. into uh, transposed into a language that will, that will make it accessible. And you can't even decide that you want to be concerned with that. You know, as a teacher, you have to uh, make a lot of different kinds of art available to students. Mm. And there comes a moment when you say, I am not even interested in this anymore. I I don't want to be a liar anymore. I don't want to have to pretend mm -hmm. even, you know, out of uh, my obligation as an instructor to um, devote myself to this. And that, that, that's know. interesting because when I spoke to you about uh, how do you want to be described, are you a sculptor? And you said, no, I'm a painter, I paint, that's what right. I do. Right, exactly. And so how do you describe that lifestyle? Well, I don't know. That's also a matter of temperament, you know. In terms of a lifestyle, that has to do with your individual personality. You know, some painters or sculptors are very bohemian, always in their life, and they they must live that way. I happen to um, need to have a very domestic environment around me, and I believe it's because if I didn't, I would just go off the deep end. Mm. And so I'm in a situation that I never dreamed of earlier in my uh, life, because um, I never thought that I would have the kinds of domestic obligations that I do now, but I, I've come to understand that they're absolutely vital for my sanity. You know? And the, the domestic uh, relationships is a wonderful wife and a fabulous son. Exactly. I see. And um, pets. Do you, and what? <laughs> and pets. And pets. Do you um, think that a person can just stick with the same media for the whole lifetime, which is what you're talking about, I think? I believe, again, and I, I don't mean to sound redundant, but it really is the case. It's a matter of temperament, you know. And as you know, earlier on, I w did very different work. The way I re sort of uh, the way my career was inaugurated were with those perforated paper paintings. Oh, we have uh, one okay. of those on the set, so we'll uh, show that, and you can talk about that. Okay. At the time when you were doing those perforated pieces, uh, I didn't realize that you were painting the paper as well. Yeah. Well, I was already painting then, but you know, ultimately. They were really very elaborate design projects, and the um, time came when I realized that I was uh, there was another part of my temperament that my crea of what I of my creativity that did not have a chance to be expressed because of the constraints of that work. You know, everything had to be designed ahead of time and then pretty much manufactured, you know, crafted. There was very little room for spontaneity or for change. So you were painting the... the yes, but in a very restricted fashion. I see. And, you know, symbolically, you know, if I would mix the colors, if there was a red, I sometimes would decide that even if, though the shape was a triangle, I would say, well, I have this rose here in my studio and I'm going to paint this the color, you know, I will mix the color that way. So, although they were abstract and they were highly designed, they already had a, one could say, a narrative quality mm -hmm. to them, these mm -hmm. pieces. You know, clearly this piece that I brought in today is really a facsimile of the works I used to do. I stopped making them many years ago, and then about 10 years ago someone came to me and said, you know, they wanted to commission one. And I mm. said, fine, I will do it. And when I was all tooled up to do it, I decided, well, I'll just make a, some for myself again. But it was very different. This is really, a, like I said, a facsimile of what the original works were really like. So the piece we saw today was a piece made 10 years after yes, the fact. Yes, yes, I see, I see. So you can't ever really go back and, and it recreate. It won't be the same, no. It's, it's like making a new piece yes. of art, they say. Yes. Um, you have always 
in my mind, had this kind of abstract, uh, surrealistic kind of quality about your work. Mm -hmm. And your influences, I think, were f uh, from Magritte and others, I believe. Well, m when I eventually turned to painting, I wasn't doing these works. But I was doing some, you know, very wild abstractions. And eventually, um, this work started to develop, but this work is that this is, what we're talking yeah, about here? Yeah, this is an unfinished is painting right now that I brought here, you know, or the the one that's next to you. Now, the foundation for these paintings um, are early Flemish masters, you mm. know, and about around that time, around ten years ago, I devoted almost an entire year of my life to reading Erwin Panofsky's book, Early Netherlandish Painting. How did you get into the Netherlands? How'd well, you it's it's something Flemish. that I've always loved. You know, it was something even early on when I was doing the other work. There was something gnawing at me, and this book, I, it was a coincidence. You know, I liked that work, but I really didn't know very much about it, and mm. I certainly didn't know very much about Panofsky, um, and it was just, you know, one of those happenstance. Um, situations. I read the book and I, I started to read it and I realized, oh, you know, this mm -hmm. is going to take a long time. Mm -hmm. So, as I said, it took the better part of a year and then I punctuated the reading of this book and all of the other subsidiary <laughs> material that goes with it um, by going to Europe and looking at these oh, paintings. Did you go to Brussels oh, and certainly. spend yeah. hours in that wonderful museum? Well, I the tried Bozarts? to spend <laughs> I tried to spend hours in Ghent uh, looking at the great uh, altarpiece there, but it was the dead of winter, <laughs> and it was colder in the church than outside. I mean, we had to flee the cold after about an hour in mm. in that cathedral. You know, it was. But, and they have other museums there where I was able to see, mm -hmm. you know, the pictures. So, just um, explain a little bit about okay. this. <laughs> All right. Now, this painting is about um, two or three years old, and it's called Vestige of Empire. And, you know, the two images you see there are images that uh, occur frequently now or have in my work. There's the insect, and then there's always some man-made object, and in this case there's that uh, brooch, and uh, clearly it comes from a it's period in French history that no longer exists, and one sort of thinks of insects surviving everything, and yet all the vanity that is associated with that picture, with that brooch in particular, that life, those people, their history, is now, you know, vapor. It's their yellow dust, as it were. And mm. so this is in that vanitas theme, you know, that obviously has its heritage going all the way back to the Flemish. And, and uh, this, uh, abstract, the head is open with... Now, yeah, this is more recent, and you can see that uh, a very large painting that I did, you, these are, you know, almost right. miniatures here, but uh, a couple of years ago I did a painting that was 8 by 16 feet long, entitled The Rapture of Dionysus. Mm. And it's a large, intricate story in that picture, many images. And um, I, uh, this has a relationship to that painting in that I think of this as uh, a the head of Bacchus, if you will. Um. You know, you think of Bacchus with the uh -huh. with um, a round the instead round, of the grape vines, right. you know, and right. uh, but here he is. He has with it. these things growing out of him. Are we going to see Tom Woodle continuing on this vein? Indeed. Good. Will. We'll watch for it. And okay. we want to thank you for being with us very much today. My pleasure. And don't go away. We'll be back with Julia Kessler.
Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and we're back with author Julia Braun Kessler. Julia was born in New York City, graduated from the University of Chicago, and earned a master's degree from Columbia University. She was an editor at Seventeen Magazine for many, many years, and since living in Southern California, she's been published in everything from Family Circle to Glamour to British Heritage. Those articles were written in Julia Kessler style. Her new book, Presumption, is written in the style of Jane Austen and under a pseudonym, Julia Barrett. Tell us about this gnome de plume, Julia. Well, it's an interesting story, Joan, because we felt, uh, my co-author and I, Gabrielle Donnelly, who is a British writer who's covering Hollywood here, so she lives in Los Angeles, so we're able to work together. Uh, she and I felt that Kessler and Donnelly hardly sounded as English, perhaps, as it should for the absolute epitome of English language writing, Jane Austen. So we took my first name and we took her grandfather's name. Oh, I wondered where that was. I knew and Julia was familiar, but I didn't know where the rest of it well, came Barrett, from. Well, Barrett qualifies. It's quite a literary name yes. as well as an English proper yes. name. So that's what we did. We chose to have that on the cover of Presumption, which um, is, uh, the, is an illustration, you might notice, of um, Chatsworth, which is the estate. Uh -huh. um, it, it's actually from a watercolor of the period, it, and um, it shows the, the um, estate, which Jane Austen actually used in, uh -huh. in, in naming hers Pemberley. I see. And your publisher is M. Evans? Yes, and of New York. A, and it was a, a funny thing about the publisher's name. What's his name? D.K.? D.K. D.K. I was going, D.K.? And you went, no, it's Irish, as yes. a matter of fact. Yes, in fact, it is. I and think it's, it's Anglo-Irish, actually. It's, it's not spelled D.K. like your tooth. It's spelled D.E.K.A.Y. No, it's, it's quite, it's, it's one of those uh, duh. I see. Uh, D.E. with a K. <laughs> That's quite a difference, isn't Yes, it? it is. Also, presumption says an entertainment. Why? Well, you know, um, Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice is probably one of the favorite books of all times. And it is, of course, a proper novel. There is nothing to improve about that novel. It's perfection, as many will uh, say. But um, we felt that there are those who love it so much that coming in with a sequel, we might be uh, presumptuous, mm -hmm. considered presumptuous. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons we chose the name was to diffuse that. I see. And then we added entertainment because it was, a, again, a demurral. We were saying, um, this is not attempting to be Jane Austen. Mm. It's merely an entertainment that flows from the good uh, times we have had with that great book. You know, you're talking about the sequel to Pride and Prejudice, which is like 180 years old and yes. one of the great uh, books of history. There's uh, Sequels seem to be quite the thing right now. Margaret Mitchell and Gone with the Wind, Daphne du Maurier's yes. Rebecca, what was the other one? Jimmy Hilton's, um, James Hilton's... Lost Horizon. Lost That's Horizons. in process, apparently. And, is and that out yet? I don't know, but they're all doing Coming. sequels. Well, it's, it's hard to account for this sudden um, enthusiasm for them, but I guess um, people do feel a great loyalty to the books that they adored as young people. Uh, they, they want more. The thing is, it's, it is, I think, according to your name, presumption, it's very presumptuous to think that you can write in the style of that person. How did you do it? And well, how that, do you <laughs> feel you can, can um, let the fans of Jane Austen feel like you're doing the right thing? Believe me, Joan, <laughs> that is the question. And indeed, um, we have heard uh, various times when we introduced the book, for example, uh, last fall at the Jane Austen Society up in Lake Louise, Canada. Somebody came up to and said, said to us, how naughty of you. Yes. And then someone else said, um, it's the effrontery of some people uh -huh. to do such. But on the other hand, um, um, we really felt that this was um, a tribute to her. Mm -hmm. We worked very hard together to see that the tone, the spirit, the very voice, and above all, the wit 
of this author was kept intact. We, did, we weren't interested in modernizing her. We weren't interested in um, equalizing her or even bringing her into our era. We were interested in pursuing what, the way she had pleased us mm -hmm. and how she could continue to do so after such a long period is always a mystery. You wrote this, there's another sequel yes. to, um, to, to uh, Pride and Prejudice. I mean, do you think In that England, yes. hundreds of people can be writing sequels? Will it dilute the market? Well, it's the curious thing is it <laughs> seems to, there's no satisfying the market. We uh, were quite surprised about this. I mean, we had no idea, as you can imagine. We simply were doing this work, and it took us considerably longer than we thought because it doesn't give to the touch. You, How long did it take? Well, uh, of course, Gabrielle's doing her journalism and her own fiction, and uh -huh. I'm doing my journalism and my nonfiction. <laughs> and uh, so we didn't write full time on this. But it did take close on to three and a half, four years. But do. and other people are talking about doing their sequels in three months. Three months <laughs> can't be done. I can't be done. <laughs> can't be done. Tell us the story of uh, Pride and Prejudice a little bit and and what we've done with it. Yes. Yes. Well, um, you know, Jane Austen um, introduces us to a very charming heroine who is not well to do. She has no uh, dowry. And in that, that period, that was a, a very serious problem. Well, she meets a, a, a terribly arrogant uh, young man um, at a dance who ignores her almost instantly and, and insults her, really, because she overhears him remarking that he he, uh, nobody's handsome enough for him. In short, he's quite uh, taken with himself, and he is an heir to this great estate, I see. Emily. However, um, she is thrown together with him um, quite soon by another situation, and her wit, her demeanor is so attractive in the sense that she's always got something very, um, clever to say, and she doesn't much care whether he likes her or not. Oh. So that, it seems, um, attracts him. The interesting thing about that romance and that courtship for everybody in the, in the long run is that the two are very much meant for one another. They play to one another, uh -huh. and it's a, it's a great sort of exchange of witticism. And by the end of the book, they both changed. They've become different people because they know that to be lovers together to have one another requires a certain adjustment. Mm -hmm. She must, as, as, as Jane Austen says, she must uh, uh, get rid of her prejudices about him and he must uh, tone down on that pride he has about mm. how good he is. Thus so, pride and prejudice. Exactly, thus pride and prejudice. Now, um, Jane Austen, we felt, uh, finished that book beautifully. On the other hand, she does say that the young sister of of uh, Fitzwilliam Darcy, the hero of Pride and Prejudice, is a man who, uh, she is a woman who, a young girl who is um, s then brought together with her new sister-in-law who I comes see. to live at Pemberley. And this new sister-in-law is a great influence on this young girl. She's 15 when we leave her in Pri at Pride I and see. Prejudice. And she's um, just developing. And of course the witticism and the the ability to uh, to turn a situation around is something that she watches in great interest. Let so me, that's what you took. That's what we took. Uh -huh. uh, that together with the famous first line. And if you would permit me, yes, we'd like I, to have. I'd you like read to that. show you what Jane Austen said and what we uh, we Good. took our our cue from. So it's Jane Austen's famous first line. You said there aren't very many famous no. first lines in... Jane Austen wrote one of the most famous lines in the English literature. We, we speak of, um, in Russian literature, we speak of Tolstoy, you know, every mm -hmm. happy family yes. is the same, but yes. unhappy, so forth. But hers goes this so way. So you're going to read... Jane Austen Jane first. Jane Austen first. And then, then I'll read what our take okay, great. on her line. Okay, great. It's a truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a wife. <laughs> now let me then read to you what we did with that sentence. If, as the prevailing wisdom, wisdom has had it these many years, a young man in possession of a good fortune is always in want of a wife, then surely the reverse must prove true as well. Mm. 
any well-favored lady of means must incline, indeed yearn, to improve her situation by seeking a husband. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yet our own heroine found herself in the singular position of contesting this complacent assurance. Miss Georgiana Darcy of Pemberley in Derbyshire, although beautiful, accomplished, and moreover an heiress to a considerable fortune, remained nevertheless at the age of 17 years markedly disinclined to secure her future happiness by bestowing that fortune upon anyone. Georgiana had reason. She is continue. a strong woman. I, she, I, there was women's liberation at that point and shows the strength of women. And the strength of women is to be smart enough to know how far right. you can go and how to manipulate. Yes. And I think you really proved we it. We picked it up. <laughs> we also picked up the fact that Jane Austen says that she, and that's the other quote we use. May I do that one yes. too? Because this one, I won't read the whole thing, but she, she says, Pembley was now Georgiana's home. This is our heroine. And the attachment of the sisters, that is to her sister Elizabeth Darcy now, was exactly what Darcy had hoped to see. They were able to love each other even as well as they intended. Mm. Georgiana had the highest opinion in the world of, Liz of Elizabeth, though she, at first she often listened with an astonishment bar bordering on alarm at her lively, sportive, um, manner of talking to her brother. You see, as she, as she says, he who al had, had always inspired in herself a respect which almost overcame her affection. She now saw the object of open pleasantry. Exactly. She was able to give then. She was and able to. We don't have very, we don't have very much time left, but do you see yourself uh, as a producer now, uh, like Jackie <laughs> Collins of some miniseries? <laughs> well, I'm afraid we've been thrust into this in a way that we have we, we had no idea. We have been reviewed everywhere exquisitely, and now we're told that we must do another classic. So there you are. So indeed, we, we are embarked on that. So uh, after Jane Austen as well? Yes. Oh, good. So when you get that done, will you come back and I'll read it to us? <laughs> Not all of it, but some of it. <laughs> Delighted to. Good. Thank Delighted. you. Thank Thanks, you. Julia Kessler, for being with us, and thank you for watching the Joan Quinn Profiles today, and we'll see you next time.